first transcontinental railroad has been called the engineering marvel of the 19th century. Even before construction began, the transcontinental railroad had precious freight to bear, the hopes and dreams of an entire nation. On the morning of January 8, 1863, in downtown Sacramento, where the railroad grade began, thousands of people watched California's new governor throw the first shovelful of dirt. Dignitaries heralded the coming of a mighty tide of wealth, such as mankind has never realized before. California still had a small population, and they had constant problems finding dependable men to fill grading and track laying crews. They put out handbills all over Northern California advertising they needed 5,000 workers immediately for good pay. They advertised for 5,000 and 200 showed up. Charlie Crocker suggested to their labor boss, James Harvey Strobridge, let's try some of the Chinese and see if they work out. And Strobridge didn't like this idea. He said, they can't be good workers. They're too weak. They're too insubstantial. Strobridge did not feel that the Chinese were physically able to do the kind of heavy labor that was required, especially in the Sierra Nevadas, the rocks, the granite, you know, the moving of this massive material. And Charles Crocker said, no, no. They can do it. They built the Great Wall. They can do it. Crocker persuaded him to try 50, and the 50 worked out. So they tried another 50, and those 50 worked out. So then they hired another 100. And slowly but surely, the labor force built up. In the Kwangtung province of China, decades of flood, famine, war, and depression had left much of the population without a decent living. Many men left home for railroad jobs in America to support their families. Others left simply to make a new life in a new land. It was at least better than working in China, where there was very little food and famine and starvation going on. By the turn of 1866, the Central Pacific had 6,000 Chinese immigrants on the payroll from ages 13 to 60. As much as 80% of the CP workforce was Chinese. For $30 a month, less board, the men worked six days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. The Chinese did the most difficult work and the most dangerous, and they were paid the least. Californians had suddenly come up with the idea that these Chinese were good workers, and so they were being hired away from the Central Pacific. And the Central Pacific raised the wages to $35 a month. It wasn't enough. This little crew went on strike. They were threatened. We will fire you if you don't go back to work. It got around to the other camps, and then all of a sudden, all of the Chinese camps were on strike. So the Central Pacific cut off their food and cut off their supplies. After about a week of running out of food, the Central Pacific managers brought uh, what looked very much like a posse of whites up to just make sure that there wasn't any rioting going on. And when the, these hungry Chinese looked out and they saw this mob of deputized whites, they realized that there was really nowhere to go. They went back to work, and they went back to work for $35 a month. For the Chinese, the thanks of a grateful nation included a series of vicious laws that blocked them from citizenship. At the tunnels near Donner Summit and across Nevada, hundreds, maybe even thousands of Chinese workers died while building the line. <laughs> 